Let's give King Jesus the greatest clap offering we could ever give him in our life tonight. Oh, come on. I know y'all better than that. Jesus, we love you. We give you all this praise, all this glory. Come on down and do whatever you want in our lives tonight, Holy Spirit. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Have your way. Oh, Spirit of the Lord is here. Woo. Come on, high five a brother beside you and tell him it's going to be a bad night for the devil. Come on, tell him that. Amen. Bad night for the devil. We've had, we've had praise, worship, ribs. We're anointed. Amen. Come on, if you can't get a healing, I'll rub a rib on you. That'll heal you. Amen. Lord is good. Praise God. Guys, I am so... Praise and worship team, guys. Thank you so much for pray, just worshiping God with such purity of heart and talent and anointing together. Come on, let these brothers know just how much you appreciate them, man. That's, that was awesome, guys. Just worship. Just worship from your heart. Chad, thanks for inviting me to be here and uh, been a real blessing. Brother Cargill, thank you, brother, for leading on all these churches. And thank God for leadership like yours that keeps making us go from glory to glory for the kingdom of God in the state of Oklahoma. Come on, let Brother Cargill know how much you love him, guys. Amen. Awesome man of God. Woo, boy, I tell you what, I've been looking forward to this, man. My goodness, praise the Lord. Y'all ready, ready to get in the Word tonight, amen? Some of you guys don't even know who I am, do you? Amen. How many of you have never heard me before? Hold your hand up. You've never heard me. Are you kidding me? You've never heard me? Serious? Well, I'm really good. And I'm humble. Amen. No. You know, so, so you guys, you know, I didn't realize this many guys had never heard me before. And, uh, you know, so here's what I've discovered, that when I go minister the word, sometimes what happens are, are people, they, they're too busy analyzing, trying to figure it out, and so they're not listening to the word because they don't really know you, you know, so they're trying to figure out, and so uh, my last name is Reif Kogel, it's a Dutch name, and you saw it on the posters, and you thought, man, they're putting the guest speaker's last name in tongues, no, nope. <laughs> it's right, guys, R-I-J-F-K-O-G-E-L, it is a Dutch name, and my daddy was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed, fair-complected Dutchman. And the brother over there is going, what happened to you, man? <laughs> well, the reason I look the way I look is because my mama is a little Chinese woman about that tall. <laughs> and if you can't tell, my eyes are slightly at a 45-degree angle. I love rice. Come on, amen? <laughs> amen. I love rice. Yes, sir. Breakfast of champions, rice. Amen. And I know it's confusing. I, I, guys, I get it. I get it. See, and that's what I don't want to happen to you because you're sitting there going, well, where's this guy from? You know? Well, and I don't want you to get confused because it could be confusing, you know, because my mama's Chinese and my daddy's Dutch. So how many know when your mama's Chinese and your daddy's Dutch, how many know you are one messed up child? Amen? <laughs> Got this European culture, dad with a Dutch brogue and this mom with their broken English and Chinese and I'm telling you, it was crazy wild. I'm telling you, we, we came to the United States in 1961. I was nine months old, floated past Ellis Island, two weeks on a boat. My mom was with six children and, and, uh, and two suitcases, all she brought. That was it, man, two suitcases. And, and, and I'm telling you, people, we, when we arrived in Garden City, Kansas, that's the first place we went, Garden City, it was sponsored by the Presbyterian Church. Those people looked at us and they said, you people are crazy. We went, yeah, <laughs> they just, you know, we're just happy in America, you know, amen? But it's confusing for me raised in a Western culture because when your mama's Chinese and your daddy's Dutch, that makes children like me the China Hutch, amen? That's what happens to you, man. I know it's messed up. I know it's messed up, guys. I know it's, I get it, it's messed up. But that's the business God's into, okay? Guys, that's the business God's into. There are things that are so messed up, and most of the time you and I have messed it up. And maybe you're sitting in this room tonight thinking, I do not fit with these kind of guys. Look at that guy over there lifting his hand. Look at that guy up there singing. And 
man, if anybody knew my dysfunction in my marriage, if anybody knew that I was bound by pornography, if, if anybody knew how much I've messed up, I, I feel like such a hypocrite in here. I don't belong with these guys. They're just too good for us. You don't un seem to understand something. I want you to know real clear, that's the business my God is into. <laughs> You're in the right place, man. You are in the right place. Because that's what he does. He takes stuff that is messed up and fouled up, and it's stuff that we've done with our own rebellion and sin. But when you give him the messed up, the fouled up, and said, Jesus, I give you my life, I give you my soul, God help me do what is right, I'll tell you he'll turn it into something you could never, ever imagine. I'm telling you, he will turn you into something that is a prize for God, man, a new creation in Jesus. Because I know it looks messed up here, because I got this last name that looks like a disease, and and uh, got these slanted eyes, uh, I love rice, and now I'm stuck with this dumb southern accent. I'm all messed up, amen? <laughs> but come on, how many other brothers all messed up, but Jesus took your mess and turned it into the greatest testimony that he saves, he forgives, he redeems. Come on, guys, give him praise if you believe that tonight, amen? I believe that. I believe that. So when uh, Chad asked me to come, and we're going to talk about uh, men of honor, we can't be men of honor until we understand how to honor God. And the first half hour of this service was spent doing one thing, giving honor to God in worship. I'm going to tell you, fellas, that the, 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 the most powerful thing you can ever do as a Jesus follower is the power of your praise and worship. So I want you to grab your Bibles. How many got your Bibles with you? E form or tree form? Hold it up real high. Amen? Hold up. Shake it in the devil's face. Make him mad. Come on, shake it. Come on. Hold your Bible up real high. Come on. Yeah, make it glow. Amen? Raise it up there. Hold, hold it up there. Amen? Come on. Hold it up there. I'm trying to locate all the Christians. Hang on just for a moment. Amen? <laughs> Raise God. Raise God. All right. Okay, I want to talk to all you brothers that don't have a Bible. I know the reason why you don't have a Bible is because you can't afford one or you'd had it here with you. And so here's what I want you to do if you cannot afford a Bible. Right after this service, I want you to go run into the nearest town you can find and go to the nearest hotel. And I want you to steal you a Gideon tonight, amen? Okay? You need the word, amen. <laughs> How many of you it's all right to have some fun in the house of God, amen? Amen. I want you to turn to Psalm 47 with me tonight, Psalm 47. And uh, brothers, while you're turning there, let me just tell you, I, I brought some resources. I really prayed about, God, what do you think that men could take beyond the two days that, can, that they could take with them and really help them, help them to really grow and understand your purpose for their life? And this came to my mind, and I'll share more tomorrow, but this is a series that really was transformational in my church. And I didn't think it would be, but it became so transformational. It's called life's work. And what I began to preach about was the theology of work. Whenever you see God, you want to talk about honoring God? We sing songs about God. We sung songs about God tonight, and they're all right. We say, God, you're holy. God, you're majestic. God, you're worthy. God, but do you know that we don't ever sing a song about the first attribute you see about him in the word of God? The first attribute you see of God, we don't sing songs about. His work. He was creating the earth. He started making the earth when it was without form or void. He starts creating and making. And the one thing we miss is we don't sing, God, you're a great worker. You're a great employer. We don't ever sing songs like that. But do you know that one of the greatest places God shows his glory is inside of work? But the Gallup poll shows us that the average American, 70% of Americans dislike their job. 20% of those 70 intentionally muck up the works at job. They hate their supervisors so much. And I got to thinking about something. Could this be the reason why revival is not happening in America? Because if I got sitting out of my church, 70 cent of peop 70 cent pre people who don't enjoy what they do for a living, who despise their work, that means they are despising the very attribute of God that started out. 
And could it be that the greatest revival will happen when you start understanding you are anointed to do what you do, whether it's construction work, flipping a hamburger, being an engineer or an attorney, and God's glory will come through it when you start seeing the anointing he's placed on you for that. In fact, when I started studying this, you know what I discovered? The first time you ever see God in the Old Testament say that he, he filled someone with the Holy Spirit. The first time you see him mention, I filled this, man, this person with the Holy Spirit, was a blue-collar worker by the name of Bezalel. And he was supposed to be working to create stuff for the, for the tabernacle. He was supposed to fashion and make things. It was in work that God said, I filled him with the Holy Spirit to do his work. And maybe the reason why we're not seeing revival in our churches is we despise the very attribute of God, and it's where you're employed. So I started, I wrote, a, I had a blessing written up that for 30 days I had everybody in our church for 30 days speak a blessing to command over the businesses the moment they walked in. It's downloadable, too. You can get up our, you can get up our website. It's downloadable, but it's a blessing that they speak over their employers, their bosses, and people for 30 days. And I said, even if you hate your job, you hate your boss, I want you to do it for 30 days. I never knew the power of what would happen. When we talk about revival, I believe the greatest part of the revival is going to happen outside of this building more than it will happen inside this building. So a lady out of our church, guys, this has got to say this. I don't know why, but I think we are asking God to do things through us. But guys, your work is the greatest anointing God has given you. So this lady is working. I heard our brother uh, talking just a moment ago about uh, all these Muslims coming to Jesus Christ. Well, a lot of the Muslims are coming to America. Detroit has the largest Muslim population just two hours, two and a half hours from, from my church in the entire nation. You go downtown Detroit, it's all in Arabic and English. Um, and they're moving to Grand Rapids. And we have a lot of Muslim companies now in Grand Rapids, Michigan. So one of the ladies from our church, she's a white lady. She works for an all-Muslim company. She is the only Christian in an entire Muslim company. Hated her job, but it was all the employment she could get. And she started speaking this blessing and started realizing that God's glory comes through my work. We anointed every one of our people, 3,000 people we anointed on a Sunday morning to go out and start being anointed to do your work. She started praying this blessing. The last Sunday that we did this, she went into her office, and the Muslim, the, the owner of the company, looked at her and said, what's wrong with you? She said, what do you mean? He says, you're glowing. Your, head, your head's glowing. Something wrong. And she said, well, let me tell you what I've done. She said, for the last four weeks I have been speaking this blessing over you and this company Muslim company not Christian not born again this is not Chick-fil-a <laughs> okay Muslims and should I've been praying this for four weeks and our pastor has told us to start praying blessing and he prayed that God would use me in this company he said, so you're the reason why it's all changed. The last four weeks, their company had grown so fast with clients that another Muslim company in the same office complex wants to know why are you guys doing so well and we're doing so bad. She said, I've been praying this. He says, well, what else has your pastor been saying? So every Monday, guys, this is no, I don't know why I'm getting into this, but this is just crazy. I got to tell you this because I'm telling you, you're anointed for what you do, guys. So every Monday after Sunday, they wanted her to give them a whole account of the sermon on Sunday in the office. Every Sunday, guys. Every Sunday. So what did he say this week? What did he say this week? Because they saw prosperity come because of a Christian not being a jerk, but being kind and speaking blessing. And she said, well, he said this. She goes, well, you know what you can do? You can just watch it live on live stream. They said, what is it? So they started watching live on live stream. Then he says, after the end of the, after the, end of the, uh, the, the, sta uh, the staff meeting, he said, would you please pray? And she said, I would pray for the company 
and I ended it in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> then they started taking the sermons I was preaching them and then playing portions of it during the staff meetings. <laughs> this has been a journey now. But out of that company, six of them have come to Jesus Christ because of what they've seen happening in their workplace. These are Muslims. And the owner came to her some time ago, came up to her, and he said, uh, I want to tell you something. He said, I want you to know, he said, uh, we're no longer a Muslim company. He said, we're a Christian company because I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And guys, I'm going to tell you something. If you hate your job, I don't want you to sing, take this job. I want you to say, take this job and love it. Amen? Amen. And I want you to see that God has put you there. He's anointed you. And sometimes your job, young man, is going to school. If you hate that teacher, you'll never see prosperity in that school. Some of you are on university campus. If you despise that backslidden atheist preacher, the atheist professor, I'm telling you, you start praying blessing on them. You'll see, you'll, there's no telling what God will begin to do through your life to bring transformation. Brothers, I'm going to tell you, I just, I, listen to it, play it over. Pastors, if you, if you got pastor to pastor, you let your pastor preach it if he wants to, okay? And you shout like it's the first time you ever heard it, amen? But I'm telling you, we could see a major revival when we start thanking God and loving the very first attribute we see displayed of God. And it's when we're working to show his anointing to the world. Amen. Oh, come on, guys. How many thank God he's alive in us? We're going to change. We are going to change the world by being changed. Amen. Okay, I don't, I don't even want to get on that. But somebody's Ginger's going to be back there to help you, so she'll help you and, uh, get that stuff. All right, guys, would you stand with me and honor the word of God today? I, I'm a little old-fashioned on this, so would you mind standing with me as we honor the word of God? Did I already tell Psalm 47? Okay, here's what the word of the Lord says. Oh, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with the voice of joy. For the Lord Most High is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. He chooses our inheritance for us, the glory of Jacob, whom he loves, Selah. God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. For God is the king of all the earth. Sing praises with a skillful song. Before you sit down, guys, I need to let you all know a little something as I get into this message, a little bit about me. Tonight, what you need to understand is that you have a Psalm 47 preacher on your hands tonight. And if this is your first time to ever be to a men's event, I want you to know you have come to a Psalm 47 men's conference. And I've already heard the worship team, there are Psalm 47 guys that know that when God says you can sing, clap, and shout, he really meant it. And the guy you're standing beside is a Psalm 47 brother in the Lord. And you're looking at that old man at the end of, the, at the end of your row and say, why does he sit there and cry and lift his hands and he's standing up and he's waving his hands? Well, let me just tell you something about that brother. He's a Psalm 47 pawpaw who's married to a Psalm 47 Mima. And when he was a teenager, he was an alcoholic and he used to... He used to be someone that cussed and would beat people and angry at, jo at God and angry at his family. But one day he met Jesus, and ever since that day he met Jesus, you can't stop him from being a Psalm 47 papa. So just leave him alone while he claps, while he shouts, and while he praises God. And I want you to know that tonight in this room, guys, you are free to be a Psalm 47 man of God in a Psalm 47 service where you can clap your hands, all you brothers. You can shout to God with a voice of triumph, and you can sing your praises to God. So, all I know is this. All I know is this, is that Satan hates 
what you're doing. And since he hates it, we love it. And since he doesn't want us to do it, we're going to do it. So I say, come on, brothers, before you sit down with all your might, your soul, give him the greatest Psalm 47 praise and clap your hands. Come on, clap your hands and shout to God with a voice of triumph. going to be a great night guys I'm telling you I, I sense the Holy Spirit in here I sense the Holy Spirit in here high five the brother again beside you and say man the devil's going to wish he never picked on you tell him that amen it's gonna be. you can be seated guys now I know guys I know there's some of you guys this may be your first time in here you may not even know Jesus Christ and so you got to have a little point of reference of first of all that the reason that we love the Psalm 47 praise, God says we can. I was raised, guys, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I was raised in a Pentecostal background. And uh, I was raised in a, an environment in church where it was okay to clap to God and to sh shout to God. And it just it wasn't only reserved for a football game. So you want to be a man of honor. Do, but do you know we honor things that don't even know who we are? I mean, I, I just wish we'd give as much energy to worship as we do to a football game. I mean, just honestly. I mean, honestly, you know, I mean, you know, I'm, don't boo and hiss, but I see the lions out there playing, and I, I see all now the political wrangling and stuff you used to just enjoy watching, and I'm just, I'm just looking at everything, and I'm, I'm just going, you know, and we all clap and cheer for those those guys why you know you're clapping and cheering for somebody who doesn't even know who you are do you realize that you know we cheer for but, but the reason I cheer is our team they're not your team not really but then that's my team no no I here's what I hear I understand I said man listen I guarantee you Matthew Stafford get more money somewhere else he'll go Dallas let somebody give him more money. He don't care about my team. He gets to get a contract. He's doing a job. What's well, my team? No, really. I mean, you don't even know. That some of them, they're not even from your state, not even from where you're from. They, yeah, but it's my team. No, really, what you're doing is uh, uh, you're praising a shirt. I mean, I don't mind. I do with the best of y'all. But honestly, we're just really celebrating over a shirt because if they leave, the shirt stays. They go get them another shirt. So when you really put it down to everything, we're really worshiping a shirt. And I'm sitting there praising guys and honoring guys that I'm not even on their radar. They don't even know who I am. And I'm sitting there rejoicing over their shirt. Now, it's cool. I mean, I, th I do with the best of y'all. But, you know, honestly, I just think we ought to be able to give God just a little bit more honor you know, if, if I mean, come on. I mean, and, and the shirt, what does the shirt do? The shirt pushes the back end of a pig's rump across a white, ch white chalk line, does really well. We all get excited because the shirt pushed the back end of a pig's rump across a white chalk line. I'd say go ahead and shout over it, but you ought to at least be able to give someone honor who knows you by name, who's got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. He knows you. He calls you his very own. Why can't we give the one who knows us who puts robes of righteousness on us, even more praise. I'm just saying. And then they walk into church and they think, well, all this sing, clap, shout, ah, no, 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 no. We, we really don't need all that, you know. We don't want to do that, you know. We don't want to do like they used to do. Back when I was a kid, they used to have these services where they would walk out. They'd be so powerful. They used to have these services where they said, yeah, it was so powerful, the sisters shouted their hair down. Okay, how many brothers have ever heard that before? How many have ever heard that? Hold it up, hold it up. Okay, you young guys. Okay, just for a minute, let, let's, let us take you to school for a moment. The sisters shouted out. Okay, here was what it was. It really, they shouted the hair down. That's back when the sisters wore these hair, and they'd pile it up real high like that. Big old, big old bun like that. Okay, that's back when, our, when the sisters lived in bondage. Okay, that's what they lived in. 
and the, you, some of you remember your mama, they used to have that, and they pin it up because they said the woman's hair was her glory. So they had more glory, and they just piled it up, you know. But when it got worship services, you know, they get a little excited, you know, and they'd be worshiping God, dance for the Lord, and all of a sudden their head would go this way, but the hair was so top heavy, it'd be over here, and then they saw her hair was over here. She'd try to get over to her hair here, and then her hair would go this way. And, and really what happened was that is what was the, was the structure of the hairdo could not keep up with the stress of her worship. And, and it started going like this, you know, and start going. And pretty soon, you know, bobby pins would come loose. And, 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 then, and then the kids would see the bobby pins coming loose. And those things would fly across the auditorium like a missile. Kids would dive under pews because they're going to get killed, you know. And, and, and the sisters would get happy. And then they shouted their hair down. That's what they, the hair would fall down. So we don't have shout your hair down services because uh, the sisters now got better hairdos. Amen? Right. Yeah, better hairdos. But, but, but and I don't, I'm not talking to say that that is the... That, that, that is the, uh, that's the measurement by which you prove spirituality. But there is something that is alarming and troubling to me where all of a sudden we walk into churches of America and we think that the praise God gives us permission to do, to clap, to sing, and shout, that that was reserved for people back then who were archaic and antiquated. It's for those people that were we call spiritual rednecks. It's for the religious country bumpkin who, who had no intelligence. So they just got their emotions massaged and they'd work the music up and they just go crazy. And I, believe me, I know there have been excesses and I do know there have been people that have gone, you know, you know, got the spirit of loopy on them sometimes. I understand that. But I'm telling you something is troubling to me where now we perceive as clapping or shouting or dancing before the Lord as something that is undignified or that no longer has a place in our worship of the believer when they can shout to God with triumph and clap unto the Lord and sing before the Lord and dance in the presence of God that somehow that is no longer that is no longer you know the kind of thing you want to do in the presence of God among people but, but, but we have no problem shouting when our little grandson, Throckmorton, kicks a soccer ball. We go absolutely crazy. We start cussing out the ref because he made a bad call. But, but, but they're, they're, they're fans. In the football field, they're fans so they can act like that. But if we do it in here, we're fanatics. But you're a fan. So you can paint half your body red, half your body white, but you're just a fan. But, if, but, but here, don't, don't, don't get too excessive. Don't, go, don't clap too much. Don't give God too much honor, the one that knows you by name, instead of giving more honor to people who don't even know who you are. Are we really men of honor? That we honor him with all our heart. Yeah, but I don't want anybody to think that I'm undignified. I'm afraid that someone might think, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm some kind of religious country bumpkin or something. If I clap my hands or if I lift my hands or whatever. Oh, oh, so, so they're fans, but we're fanatics. Hold on just a moment, just for a second, just for a second. Do you see anybody in this service at any given time with one of those big, dumb, red foam rubber fingers stand up going, yeah, Jesus, he's number one, Pastor Sam. Have you seen that tonight? So we're going to hold back our worship here, but get excited out there because we fear being persecuted or made fun of for the expressions of joyful praise before God as men of God. I mean, come on, I shout with the best of them out there. But I mean, how many do you, have you really watched it, man? A guy makes a good drive, catches a good pass, he's coming back to the huddle. I mean, coming back, you really, are we really the ones, really, that are the fanatics? I mean, the guy comes back to the huddle, and these are, man, these are bruiser dudes, man. I mean, they're big guys, they're trained. And when they come back to the huddle after making a good drive, they come back to the huddle and they do this to him. I'm just saying. I mean, after my message, do you see, do you see Brother Cargill coming to me after the service going, hey, good message, Pastor Sam, good message. Hey, that's a good message, buddy. Woo, that's a good message. Woo, good message. Do you see that happening here? So why are you allowing the world and the intimidation of people to hinder you from responding, young man, or praising God, sir, the way you were designed to praise God? I say what you're doing out there on the field is an indicator of what God created you to do, and that's to give the one who's the all-glorious, all-powerful, almighty God, all the praise, all the glory, all the adoration, to clap your hands and to praise him with all your might. So, okay, so Pastor Sam, okay, yeah, yeah, but why do we do this? Well, why do you do what you do? 
Well, we just always done it. Just get excited out there. You know, I, you know, we did that in church a lot, you know, because I, I was a kid raised in church. You know, we couldn't do this, couldn't do this, couldn't do this. And why can't we do that? Well, we just don't do that. Well, why do we do this? Well, we, we love God. No, I'm the kind of guy that I want to know why you do what you do. So you tell me, Pastor, and the Word of God says clap, sing, shout. Well, why do you think, why should I do that? Tell me why. Just because you say it? See, if you don't tell the next generation, my brothers, why you do what you do and why you believe what you believe, they will cease to believe what you believe and stop doing what you know to do if you can't explain why we do what we do and why I believe what we believe. So I just don't want to tell you guys, be men that are liberated by the Spirit of God, born again, to be men that are vessels of praise. Why did he say, respond that way? What happens? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'd like to break it down for you today. Psalm 47, 1. Let, let, let's, let's, let's just break it down for a little bit. It says, clap your hands three quarters of you people. Help me out, little brothers. How many? All you people. So why, why, why clap? Why clap, Pastor? I mean, what, why clap? The reason why we clap is when you look at this word is that you'll discover that clapping, when understanding of why you're doing what you're doing, when you're singing a song, when there's something said powerful when your pastor says it, or when it's an appropriate time to break forth in applause, the reason why we clap is that clapping attracts. It draws something. It pulls something that otherwise would not be there. In fact, when you look at the word clap there, there's something different about this Hebrew word about clapping. The word clap there means to express joy, appreciation, encouragement. In fact, guys, if I could just even do it this way, it literally, it, it literally means to welcome or to greet someone as if they are entering into a room. You think about this for a moment. The most important individual in this room is not me, and it's not you. The most important thing in this room is the presence of the Holy Spirit of God in this room right now. And, and when you clap with understanding, it is literally saying you are showing appreciation, you are encouraging the Holy Spirit to have his way and come into this service, come into your life, invade my space come on in Jesus you are literally inviting him to come in come on we clap for presidents and kings and heads of states and governors and mayors but we fold our arms and sit like floor lamps in a church wondering why God isn't moving and we start church at 11 o'clock sharp and we end at 12 o'clock dull wondering why God's not changing anybody nobody's getting saved it's because if we treated our wives the same way we treat the Holy Spirit it'd be a cold night every night in Oklahoma it literally means that I am welcoming and saying Holy Spirit come on in welcome in and how many know when the how many know when Jesus comes in when he comes in one way the enemy will run out seven ways Bring him into this place, guys. Bring him into your situation. Bring him in to your affliction. Bring him into your financial problem. Begin to worship and say, God, I welcome you into this place. Yeah, but you know, no, what if we, what if we did treat our wives the way we treat the Holy Spirit sometimes? Well, the Lord knows I love him. I don't need to do that. He can read my mind. Well, okay. What if we do the same thing? with your spouse well I, I may be able to help some marriages right now tonight in fact I think I am going to seriously I think I'm going to help somebody's marriage right now I love my wife I'm telling you she's my secret weapon she's the greatest thing since Dr. Pepper it's pretty good and, and I want to tell you something I, I just I got to tell you something I'm going to I've got to I've got to I've got to preach here uh, tonight tomorrow morning 
I fly home tomorrow, tomorrow evening. I'll go preach twice Sunday morning, get on a plane, go down to another district in Florida, and I'll go preach there uh, twice Monday and twice uh, Tuesday. My wife is going to want to see me when I get home. And when I get home, if I get home and I say the same thing to her that I'm going to do the Lord, that he can read my mind and he knows my heart, you know, worship starts in the heart. What if I did the same thing to my wife and I haven't seen her for four days and I come home and I stand in the bedroom and I do like some people do at church? And she says, what are you doing? Loving you. In my heart. How many know she's going to get a frying pan laid between my eyes and beat the devil out of me that got in me while I was away? Because how does my wife know that I truly have honor for her? Praise is not praise until it is articulated. Praise is not praise until it's demonstrated. All of a sudden, what's in my heart has to begin to manifest in a way. But when I go up to my wife, and I hadn't seen her, and it's... But when I walk up to her and I say, Baby, look what I bought you eyes away. Ooh. And I go take my arms, and I don't sit there and hold them to the side and say, I just don't respond. It's just not my personality. I go put my arms around her and say, Baby, I love you. 27 years, I tell you what, line up all the women in this world, I'd pick you all over again. Let me just tell you, bro, it's going to be a good night. It's going to be a good night. Some people would wonder why they don't feel anything in their youth group. They feel nothing. Their church is dead. They blame the youth pastor. They blame the pastor. They blame people who don't got the right kind of music. Who don't have the right kind of mu instruments. Who don't have the kind of lights they have over there. If we had those kind of lights, then God would begin to move. If we had those big old screens, God would begin to move. It has nothing to do with your screens. It has nothing to do with your 15-minute guitar solo. It has nothing to do with how great a pastor is. It has everything to do with you lifting your voice and saying, Lord, I clap my hands to attract you and draw you and bring you into this place. Everybody loves to be complimented. Everybody loves to be one and welcome him and love him and draw him into the situation. Come on, I love to, I don't know about you, but I love to hang around people that say, hey, that was a good word, man. I really pre I don't like people that pick on me and say, I don't like what you wore. I could have really got something out of God if you just wouldn't wear black tonight. Why'd you wear black tonight? I like to get around somebody who tells me, hey, I like you. And then, you know, you know, be that kind of a person that compliments people. You say, well, I, you know, I'm not good with compliments, and they don't dress good. They got bad breath. They wear ugly clothes. And, you know, you can find something good to say. You know, hey, those are nice shoes. They look like they both Fit. I mean, just, I mean, <laughs> be a person of praise, guys. Come on. And when he says, clap your hands, all your people, come on. We are welcoming the presence of God. We are welcoming the Holy Spirit. Come on, guys. Let's begin to praise him with a clap offering and say, Holy Spirit, come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. All right. I'm going to kind of take you a little deeper. So clapping not only attracts. But there was another part of clapping that you see in the word that attacks. It literally becomes a weapon against your adversary. Go home and read this, guys. Go, go, go right, the, go right, go right down Ezekiel 6:11. God tells Ezekiel, he says to him, "Go act out my judgment against my people." And he says, "Here's how I want you to do it." He said, I want you to stand before them. Go, go read when you get home. He said, I want you to clap your hands, strike your hands, flesh upon flesh, and stomp your feet. That's all he said. He said, strike your hands, stomp your feet. Now, the clapping there is not to attract or encourage or to show appreciation or joy. When you see clapping there, you might see the English word clap, but it meant something totally different there. The act of clapping there was actually an act of disdain to ridicule or to mock your enemy, to scorn your adversary. 
It literally meant that he was putting judgment on them by simply the action of clapping his hands and stomping his feet. He was literally saying, the judgment comes upon you. God ridicules you. God scorns you. God mocks you. Guys, listen to this. When we begin to clap our hands in a service, it not only attracts the presence of God, but it's carrying out the judgment of God upon your enemy, Satan, every time you begin to praise God. It says, I mock you, I scorn you, I ridicule you. Do you know, do you know seriously, do you know among heathen pagan religions, they understand this better than most Pentecostals do? Um, how many of you guys know what sumo wrestling is? How many of you guys know what sumo wrestling is? Y'all see, you know, that's what, that's what I felt like. God had called me to be before I went in the ministry. I was going to be a sumo wrestler. Got on that low-carb diet. Look what happened. So, 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 sumo wrestlers, what do they do? If you've ever seen them, traditional sumos know this part. Uh, They'll get out there like this. You know, they walk out, and they go out there, and then they come up, and they face their opponent, their enemy, and they'll do this. Have you ever seen this? They'll they'll throw that, the salt, and then they'll do this. They'll do that. So, Traditional sumos, the reason the striking of the hand was there was the striking of the hand was actually an act of driving away evil or dark spirits before you enter into the war with your opponent. It was to drive away spirits, dark spirits, evil spirits. Even pagans have a somewhat of an understanding of just that little act. Now, how many know when the devil watches, you know, a sumo wrestler, you know, going out there doing this? You know, how many know there's no threat to Satan at all, okay? He just, you know, sees a, you know, a huge baby in an oversized diaper playing patty cake. Okay, this is not going to, this is no threat at all. But my brothers, when you hear your pastor say, say something, he's preaching something, and you can sense the anointing of God, and you can sense it's appropriate in that time to begin to applaud at a word, what you are really doing is you are not just acknowledging the world, you are sending a judgment against the enemy. You're saying, I mock you, I scorn you, we pronounce this judgment upon you. Guys, the enemy hates when you clap before the Lord to attract his presence, and he hates it because it begins to destroy him. How many believe we ought to clap our hands one more time and begin to put the enemy at flight tonight? Put him at flight tonight in the name of Jesus. Oh, clap your hands, everybody. Hallelujah, guys. Woo. So let's go, now let's go, let's go a little deeper. He says, oh, clap your hands, all you people, and then do what, guys? No, 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 it's not, it's not, shout, shout, yeah, yeah, it's, shout! Shout unto God with a voice of joy or triumph. Shout to God. Why do we shout? When you look in the Word of God, you'll see that sometimes the shouts of praise were an aggressive faith act. As they would go into battle, it was, it was a declaration and an intimidation against the adversaries. Now look at Psalm 61. It says, let God arise, let God arise, and let his enemies be what, everybody? Let those who hate him flee before him. He says, let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. People say, how do I get rid of the devil? How do I get rid of the devil? You don't need to know how to get rid of the devil. If God arises, your enemy flees. So my question ought to not be, how do I drive the devil out of this problem? Your question ought to be, how do I allow God to arise? And I know what the, I know what the outcome will be of God arising. So what I got to find out is, what's something of a pure act of worship with understanding, a pure act of praise, that gets God to arise? Glad you asked. Psalm 47, verse 5. God has ascended with a... He ascends with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Here's what that really was. Those folks would have understood it clearly. Whenever a king would go up to his throne, which was the place where he would begin to bring his authority, every time he ascended up a step, the people would begin to lift their shouts to that king. And every time they'd shout, he'd step up another, and the shout would intensify. With the next step they would shout, he would keep going until he finally sat in the place of of that throne that was now the authority whereby he could rule. 
Can I tell you what happens to you and me so many times? What happens to us so many times is we allow our crisis to ascend, the doubt of the enemy to ascend, to allow our temptations to ascend, to allow our addictions to ascend. But he says, when you begin to praise God in the middle of your crisis, in the middle of your bondage, and begin to thank God for his victory in your life, he says, what God does is God starts ascending with each shout of praise that you give, and you allow him to sit in that place of authority to rule over every power of darkness. Come on, guys. How many believe it's time to allow the Lord to ascend and the enemy to be scattered? I'm telling you, too many people, that shout of praise, it's actually the Hebrew word shabak, means to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. It's aggressive faith act. God arises in the shouts of praise. Let's go to verse 6 now. Okay, let's see if you all can figure out what we got to do next, okay? It's going to take a lot of word of knowledge to figure this one out, but here it is. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing For God is the king of all the earth, sing praises with a skillful song. Brothers, what are we supposed to do next? And he says, you know, when you sing, sing with a skillful song. Now, I know all of us aren't as talented as these guys are up here. I, I appreciate these guys when they sing. You can tell these boys practiced, didn't you? They're practicing. They're working, you know. They developed their gift. When I was an evangelist, I used to go to churches. I was evangelist for 21 years before I pastored now for almost 13 years and and uh, I go to some churches, and they, they, they didn't want to practice. You know you, you know what I'm talking about. You know, they didn't want to practice, and they'd get up and start singing a special, and they'd forget the words, and so they'd start crying, act like they was in the spirit. <laughs> I'd say, why don't you sit down and practice and, and, and give God the time he needs on this one, you know? They'd start singing. And you listen to them sing, and they say, we have a singing ministry. And you could tell they didn't practice, because when they started playing, it didn't sound like a singing ministry. It sounded like a prison ministry. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? Because when they started singing, somebody was behind a few bars, and somebody lost the key. Come on, amen? It's more like prison ministry. They start singing. Lord Jesus, help us all. Sing praises. Guys, let me just tell you something. Something happened. I was, was, I was listening to these guys singing and exhorting. You could tell there were men in this place that were having a breakthrough before the word was even brought to you. I mean, when that young man started exhorting and giving words, some of you started lighting it. I know my God. He moves the mountains, and he can do it again. And I start feeling that rising up. Started rising up in some of you guys. What was happening was, is your song gives birth to miracles. There's, there's a reason why Isaiah 54, 1 says, Sing, O barren woman who never bore children. Burst into song. Shout for joy. You who were never in labor, because more the children of the desolate woman than of her who, who has a husband, says the Lord. God says, when you begin to worship him, things begin to happen, guys, in the supernatural realm. Just when you begin to sing, and you don't know what to do. You're in the middle of a crisis, the middle of an argument in your marriage, but you pull away and say, God, let me worship you. Get in his presence, guys. God starts birthing things you can never imagine. You know what I really believe? I honestly believe, brothers, I'm going to come back down here again. I honestly believe that this is the reason why Satan has so many wars in churches over the songs that are being sung. Guys, don't be a party to it. Guys, listen to me. Don't be a party to it. I've been raised in church all my life, and I'm going to tell you, there are songs that are different for me, sometimes hard for me to get the rhythm, sometimes it's a different for me, the approach is different, but I'm going to tell you something, guys, don't be a party of it, because the first murder that ever happened in the Bible, the first killing in the Bible happened over worship. And that killing is still going on. Because one's worship was accepted, the other was rejected. And I'm telling you that Satan creates more wars 
And most of the time, guys, it's not over the power of a song. It's over your personal preference of a song. Never allow preference to become truth in your life. Let the word of God be the truth. You guys following me on this? Because what happens so many times is we confuse style for substance. You, the song that some people may have dissed may have been the very song that God was going to use to liberate their child. I'm not saying that songs of the past aren't bad or songs of today are bad. I'm just simply saying, you know, sometimes I tell some folks, okay, you want me to save your song or save your grandson? Which one do you want? The greatest thing I want to hear from our senior citizens out of our church, the greatest thing I want to hear them, hear, hear, hear them say is, I want them to come to me and say, you know what my grandson said? My grandson said to me, I want to go to Pawpaw's church. That's where I'm going. I'm going to go to Meemaw's church. That's where I'm going because they feel the irresistible environment of the Holy Spirit in what's engaging them to hear the gospel. I wonder how many church services have been murdered because someone harumped and folded their arms because the rhythm wasn't theirs. And I get you, I understand, it's tough, it's as tough for me as it is for you. But I wonder how many times we folded our arms and Satan knew that the song was going to give birth to something, so he wanted it aborted and stopped your song, not over the substance of the song, but over the style of the song. Why, don't, why can't we at least have the same tolerance for the worship that comes in songs that we do when it comes to restaurants? How many are glad that every restaurant in whatever city you live in, how many are glad that all the restaurants are not Taco Bell? Thank you, Jesus. They had that one slogan, run to the border. No, it's run to the bathroom, man. <laughs> gotta, gotta, gotta run to the bathroom. How many glad that all the restaurants in your town are not Italian food? Okay. How many glad all the restaurants in your town are not Chinese food? Don't you dare raise your hands. Put your hands down. You support my people. Come on, amen. That's why we look like this, man. Nobody's buying our food. Isn't that interesting? How you don't want to eat chicken nuggets every day for the rest of your life. But we put that same kind of demand on God when it comes to the food he gives us through worship and someone that may teach. We may think that the only kind of person I can listen to preach is a guy who teaches line upon line, precept upon precept breaks down all the Greek and the Hebrew before I want to listen to that because nothing else is anointed. And that other guy, he raises his voice. I can't stand to listen to him because that's not anointed. He's just exciting the people. Then you get the flip side. I tell you what, man, I just don't like to listen to that droning on and just exegeting hominudus, Herman, somebody they're wanting to give me in the sermons. I want some preaching, man. That's anointed. So when did just because they have volume or just because they don't use volume mean that it's anointed? You know? I watch people just, you know, if somebody just teaches the word, they don't think it's anointed. And if a guy can fluctuate his voice and get loud, he's anointed. That's anointing right there. You know, they hit all fly away at 90 miles an hour until Sister Bueller gets the hippie-jibbies, jump by pews so the preacher hyperventilates and blood vessels pop out his forehead and we all thought, now that, that's, that's anointing right there. <laughs> it's not anointing until he gets them hot tars when he preaches. He gets them hot tars. That's a Holy Ghost, honey. Hot tars. Y'all don't know what the hot tars are? Come on, you're from Oklahoma. You all know what the hot tars are, don't you? 
Come on, that's when preachers get going there. And God said his word. And you're going to have the power today. And you're going to shake you. You're going to bake you. You're going to make you. You're going to move you. People are falling out. You say, what did he say? I don't know, but I feel better. You know what I mean? Just crazy. That, I'm not saying it's not anointing. I'm just saying that's preference and style. And I wonder how many times God has stopped our songs because we never looked at the substance. We just couldn't stand the container it came in. I love dinner on the grounds. I love dinner on the grounds. When them old Swedish meatballs come out and you got that green bean casserole with the little French onions toasted on the top, you got you some nice greasy old fried chicken. Just forget chapstick, man. Just go with it, you know. And, but what if we had dinner on the grounds? Hold on, what if we did dinner on the grounds and your son was behind you and he went to go reach for a, he's hungry, everybody's out, and he go grabs a leg of chicken and as he reaches out, you pass by the chicken, he reaches out to grab the chicken. And you go, Don't touch that chicken. What is it, Dad? What is it, Dad? You sense, you sense food poisoning? No. What is it, Dad? Why can't I have the chicken? You see that dish? Yeah, Dad, wasn't washed? No. It's a rectangle dish, and your mother and I do not eat out of rectangle dishes. <laughs> Good meat. I just don't like rectangle dishes. Green bean casserole there, your son's starving, starving to eat. It's going to taste like it. Don't touch the green bean. What is he, Dad? You see that dish? Yes, Father. What is it? Salmonella? What is it, Father? What is it? That's an oval dish, and we refuse to eat out of oval dishes. I wonder how many people we have turned off from the gospel because they were different than us, and they were an oval dish. I wonder how many times the song might have been there, and that song may have been the very song that God was going to break through the depression off of your body when you started worshiping in that song, but you didn't like it because it came in an oval dish. Friends, let me just tell you what. God prepares a table for us every single day that we can dine from, and I don't care if he brings it in an oval dish, a square dish. I don't care if he brings it in a hexagon dish. I don't care if he brings it in a white dish or a yellow dish or a brown dish or a... Chinese dish or a black dish. I don't care what kind of, if he brings it in a red dish, I don't care. Just stick your fork in and taste and see that the Lord is good and eat all the substance that is Jesus Christ and him crucified and watch God give birth to a miracle, guys. There is power when you begin to praise, to clap, to sing, to shout. The enemy despises it when you do that. You want to be a man of honor? You want to be a teenage of honor? Then worship him with all your heart and give honor to the one who knows you by name more than the honor you give to people who don't even know who you are or where you live. Okay. All right, I'm, I'm coming in for a landing, guys, okay? I'm coming in for a landing, I promise. I can't keep you all here all night. Okay, I, I'd like for my, the worship team to come and my, my brother drummer to come up for a moment. I'm looking for something here. I promise you, I'm looking for something. Oh, here it is. Okay. I'm going to show you something, guys. I'm going to close with this to show you the power of why Satan doesn't want you praising in the middle of the problems in your marriage right now, worshiping God no matter what's going on in the middle of the chemotherapy, in the middle of the financial problems for you to enter into God and start honoring him and worshiping him in it. The enemy knows something powerful, 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 powerful happens. Now, to illustrate what happens when you worship, I'm going to need a, I need a, I need a good, I need a good belt. Somebody's got a good leather belt on. Somebody got one on? I got this little cloth thing on. It's kind of wimpy. I need a good, I need a good whipping belt. You got one on, brother? Oh, awesome. he's on the front row too, man. Oh, use this on what? Never mind. <laughs> what's, your, what's your first name? Mike. Mike. Thanks, Mike. Mike, let me use this, okay? I'm going to try to be gentle with it, all right? 
All right, Mike. I know I've been telling everybody to sing, clap, dance, shout, but you stay seated, amen? You don't have a belt, amen? So, so you can remain seated. Or everybody get your cameras out because we could win $100,000, amen? I know, get this out of the way. Oh, this thing's heavy, man. Dogs. All right, I want you to see something. Worship's motivation is not about attacking the enemy, okay? Get that. Get that, guys. The honor of worship is purely about him, whether you receive the miracle you wanted or not. It's about him. That's the motivation. But I am telling you that out of that praise comes blessings that the enemy knows happens when you start adoring the Lord with your worship and your praise. Okay, I want to read a scripture to you out of Isaiah to show you what happens when we praise, okay? So, so Isaiah 30, verse 31, brothers, if you can put that up on the screens, okay? And it says, the voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. Now, let me stop there just for a moment, back up for a moment. Whenever God spoke to Assyria, okay, he would not just speak to the king, but you could see him, even when you see him speaking through the prophets, he would speak directly to Satan himself. Because much of the attack, the destruction that the Assyrians would have put was driven by Satan himself to wipe out the lineage of the Jews, to wipe out, so there's going to be no Jesus. So when, whenever you see God speaking to Assyria, you actually see him speaking to Satan himself. Now listen, so, so to keep that in mind, what I say is, the voice of the Lord will shatter Assyria. With his rod, he will strike them down. Every stroke, listen, the Lord lays on them. These are the enemies of God's people. Every stroke the Lord lays on them with his punishing club will be to the music of timbrels and harps as he fights them in battle with the blows of his arm. Did you, guys, are you looking at that real close for a moment? We men want to defend, we want to fight, and God put that nature within us to defend, to fight for what is right. But listen closely. There are some times you have no energy to fight, you are at your wit's end, you don't know what to do. As you heard the brother say, it's impossible, there's no way out of this. And the only recourse you have is to cry out to God. And God says, Satan... This is what you've done to my people, but I am getting ready to get my punishing club. I'm going to get ready to go get my belt. I'm getting ready to hunt you down. And when I swing, the swinging of my punishing rod on you, Satan, will be to the sound that I hear of music, timbrels, harps. What he's saying, when I hear the praise, I begin to punish So, so are, you, are you understanding this? The reason the enemy would rather have you sit there and never respond, keep you in offense, saying, if God really loved me, why? The reason why he wants you to do that is because he knows the moment that God hears music, worship coming out of his people, God starts getting his punishing rod to do some serious business on your adversary, Satan. Okay, I, let me, I gotta illustrate that. Baptists would be shouting by now, guys. Come on, you gotta. I'm just kidding. I'm gonna give you a moment, I'll give you another chance. So here's what we're gonna do. Many of you brothers have come in here with situations that you feel like you have no control over anymore. I'm telling you the power of your worship to honor God just for who He is can take that demon and destroy him right now. You don't have to fight. He fights him with the blows of his arm. So right here, this is, this is going to represent the one that's splitting up your marriage right now. This is the one that had the spirit of suicide in your family, and now you're contemplating thoughts of suicide. This is the one that's messing with your mind about your sexuality. 
This is the one that's sitting there tormenting and trying to divide your, your church pastor. This is the one that's trying to come and divide you from your son who won't talk to you anymore. This is, this is the one that's trying to take your pay. This is the one that's coming against your body with sickness and disease. And God says, when I begin to hear the sound of worship and praise, he said, I hear him worshiping. I grab my punishing rod and I go hunt down your enemy. And I said, oh, so you're the one that's held his son in that addiction. Well, I hear him at a men's conference. He's on the third row. He's about the fifth guy from the right, and he's sitting there worshiping me, and he's praising me for his son, his deliverance, and all I got to tell you, Satan, is this. Don't you ever touch his son ever again because when you touch his boy, you are messing with me because that's my creation. He's made in my image with my purpose that's what God begins to do he goes and begins to find the guy who's in financial problems whose marriage is all messed up and your wife's getting ready to leave but you're still singing your song saying God I know you can restore God goes to that devil and says so you're the one that's trying to break up that marriage I want you to know he's worshiping me and don't you ever touch my son or my daughter ever again that's not their marriage, that's my marriage. And what I put together, no man shall put asunder. He's going to praise me for his wife. What I'm trying to tell you guys is if you'll keep on singing, he'll keep on swinging. Come on, why don't you lift up a praise before God and give him the mighty praise and turn the weapon back on the enemy. Are you hearing me, guys? Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying to you? Remain standing, my brothers. I don't, I, don't, I don't know which one of you guys is facing what. But every time you wake up, the devil, the devil is scared. You don't need to be afraid. He is afraid of you. When I read the Word of God and I look... In Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, when I read the word of God, God said, when I created Lucifer, I created within him part, pipes and harps that when he began to worship the host of heaven, all the hosts of heaven would worship as Lucifer within, with, created within him would begin to lead the host of heaven. He was, look, there were three predominant angels in the word of God, guys. When you look at Michael, he was a warring angel. He protects Israel. When you look at Gabriel, he was the messenger. He sent the messenger. But when you look at Lucifer, you find him as one that is the minister of music leading the host of heaven. Well, guys, you know exactly what happened. Ezekiel and Isaiah both said, I saw him be cast down from a heaven. He said, I will ascend above the heights. I will go above God. He thought, because everybody was looking at me, he said, I will ascend above God. God says, you're not going up. You're coming down. And guys, here's what happened. God booted the minister of music out. And when I read the Word of God, I never see where God ever replaced him. So what I'm trying to tell you is I've been reading the Kingdom Classifieds, and the job is still open. The job's still open, guys. You say, well, I, I've, never been to, I've never studied music. I, 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 I don't know anything about music. I'm, I'm, I'm clapping on one and three when they're supposed to be clapping on two and four. I, I, I've never been to Juilliard. I, don't, I, I can't even hum. I, 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 can't even, I can't even whistle and chew gum at the same time. I, I don't qualify. Oh, God really lowered the standard for it. All he said is, he, he, says, he said, let everything that have breath praise the Lord. If you can suck in air, that's all God requires. All he's asking is for a man to honor him with all the worship and all the praise. Guys, what I'm telling you is you took Lucifer's place to worship the most beautiful one in all the universe, the Lord your God. I don't know what you're going through, guys. But your worship has a power to strike down the enemy, to strike him down. There's guys in here, man, you've pleaded, you've been speaking the blood of Jesus, you've been binding every devil, and you're still dealing with the addiction. Have you ever thought about just getting up there and just start worshiping God when the middle of the temptation comes and say, God, I'll give you glory. 
I didn't give you honor. And you know what God will do? God will get up and he'll grab his punishing rod and he will beat the hound out of Satan as you just begin to worship in the middle of it. Your greatest victory comes out of your honor to glorify and worship him. Come on, brothers. Can we lift our voices? Can we begin to thank him right now? Just bless his name. Begin to bless him. Holy Spirit, move through this place.